Hey guys, this is your girl Paula, the queen from Queens. These are money minutes that matters. This is a talk show. Will you call me with financial questions and I'll give you financial advice. On this show, we become accountability buddies. We'll walk hand in hand to eliminate debt, to help you maximize your financial future and to optimize your health. I'm a nurse anesthetist. I've been practicing anesthesia for more than 20 years. These are special segments. I'm going to coin these segments, the cost of living. So because I'm your resource, I have a wealth of resources available to me that I'm going to bring to you on the show. So this is my friend, Mr. Antoine Harris. He is the president and founder of Platinum Bridges Wealth Manage Wealth Strategies. He has his bachelor's from the University of Maryland. He has his MBA from Georgetown University. He was once the vice president of a Fortune 500 wealth management company. Hi, Antoine. How you doing, Paula? Good to see you. You too. Thank you for being a part of the show. Happy to do it. No, I appreciate you. And as I was just saying to my audience, I'm their resource, but you're one of my many very knowledgeable resources, and I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you too. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about how you got started in managing finances. Well, it's a long story. So I, I, uh, I was born, I was born in a, a small town in New Jersey, um, by the Jersey Shore from Cape May, New Jersey. And, um, you know, we, we weren't really raised talking about money. So the extent of financial planning that we did, my, my grandparents raised me. And my pop was a, um, a mason contractor, you know, he laid brick. And my grandma was Avon lady. So I used to work for my pop while growing up. And I used to work, and my, my rules were I had to save a third for college, a third for my school clothes, and I could spend a third. And that was the extent of my financial training. So, you know, I didn't know anything about the stock market or about 401ks or investing. But fortunately, when I was in high school, um, I was on the basketball team, and my coach was teaching an economics class, and he owned a, a bar down there. So they had a stock simulation game and I was part of the stock simulation game and we had a hundred thousand dollars of fake money and we were able to invest it. And we actually did really well. I was captain of, captain of this little team that we had and they ranked us against different teams throughout the state of New Jersey. We were ranked in the state and we turned that little hundred thousand dollars into a whole bunch of money. And if it was real money, we'd have been really rich. So I was like, wow, this is crazy. So once I learned that, I didn't have any real money. So I said, the first chance I get, I'm gonna learn everything I can and buy some stocks. So when I was in college, I used to read the little finance magazines and I still didn't have any money. But when I graduated, I was a pharmaceutical representative and I got a bonus check for $3,000. And this is a hundred years ago when everybody was wearing Tommy Hilfiger back in the day. And I bought some Tommy Hilfiger stock and it did really well. And, you know, my little $3,000 maybe doubled or something like that. And I thought I had a lot of money. And I, I just kept from there. I was just hooked. So I, I was reading. I mean, you have to ask my friends. I was reading stock books all the time. I would take them on vacation. I was a stock. I was a um, pharmaceutical rep. So I used to wait for the doctors. And I would have all my books with me, reading them all the time. So I just decided I just wanted to do it for real. So I, I left pharmaceuticals after a couple of years. I went back to school. That's when I went to Georgetown. I did my MBA in finance and I was captain of the investment team there. And by this time, my little bit of money had turned into still a small amount of money, but it was more than what I had. So then when I graduated, I was a day trader. Yeah, so yeah. I was day trading. And that, that day trading experience, um, that's when I really learned. I really learned everything because I only had about $40,000 at that time to my name. And I had $40,000 in student loans and I had a daughter and I was day trading for a living and everything I had in the world was in this little 40,000 buck and I, that needed to pay all my bills. So when you have that kind of pressure, you start learning fast. So I was, I was learning um, in real time with a bunch at stake. So um, that was a really good experience. So then from there, I became a financial advisor. So I've been doing this for a little more than 18 years. I worked for some big companies and I launched my firm about three years ago. You know, you tell this story, you told the story about how you ate the most expensive sandwich of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't 
you share a little bit about that sandwich, that really good sandwich? Well, that cost you a lot of money. Um, when I was day trading, I mean, it's a highly, highly stressful job. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I had over a thousand trades in that year. I did it for about a year. Um, it just, the, the, the toll it took. Um, you get up in the morning when the markets, you, you prepare for when the markets open, the markets open at 9.30 in the morning and you're in front of the computer the whole day and you can't leave. So I tried to go microwave a sandwich one time and lost like $3,000 in like three or four minutes. And I came back, so then I stopped eating lunch. So then like by the time the day is over, the market closes at four, you know, your neck is just, you're just, it's just too much. So um, I started with 40, I paid all my bills for the year nice. and I ended with 40. So I, I call that a win. That's a win, <laughs> that, that's, that's positive in my book. Right, so there you go. just like you, we, we have a lot of similarities why we get along so well. We're from the tri-state area, I'm from New York, you're from New Jersey. We both grew up by the water. I'm from Fort Rockaway. You're from Cape May. But also, we um, both were raised by older, um, older parents. My dad had me in his late 40s. Okay. So he would have little pearls of wisdom. Now, because he was a sharecropper back in North Carolina, he didn't have access to education. He only went to school in the winter months. But he would say two things. One, he would say, a hard day's work gives you a hard day's pay. And then he would say, if you can better your condition, then move. Now, <laughs> interpret that as you may. But for me, that meant that don't become too comfortable. Right. Improve your condition. Go back to school. Try something different. And that was my motivation factor. So growing up with your grandparents, are there pearls of wisdom that helped to shape you to be the person that you are today? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, quite a bit. My, my, my grandfather... You know, he was, he was born in 1920, so he was different. He wasn't like, you know, the, the guys you see today where they're holding and hugging and coddling. He wasn't that dude. He was a very good man, but he was leading more by example. He would take me out and say, hey, look, you can do this and break your back for the rest of your life or you can go to college. What you want to do? Okay. And that was his main thing. He just was like, I'm going to show you what it takes if you don't have something that you can use up here and have a, some pieces of paper that you can present to people. You're going to have to do stuff like this. And he had to do it. He loved doing what he did, but he worked until he was in his 80s. Mm -hmm. And he loved it, but he had to. Because he didn't have, you know, a, there wasn't a such thing as an investment plan for a black, blue-collar man with, you know, a high school diploma back then. So you just kept, you, if you didn't earn it, it wasn't going to be there. So he, I, from that experience, you know, I learned a lot. Um, my grandmother was more the cobbler and she was the Avon lady and I started keeping the books and everything. And she would always have a little something stashed someplace if there was a house emergency. And we always had house emergency. So he got cold and he couldn't work. I might have to get some money from somewhere. So she'd go and pull the box out. That's it. Then put the box, hide the box again. So we had, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, all that, all that was a lot of what I learned. Um, just as far as I, I've always been very prudent with my money, even before I started investing. I think a lot of it came from those experiences. And um, I don't take anything for granted. Well, I need to say right off that I'm not getting any kick kickbacks. So if anyone who hears this show decides to give you a call, that's between you and them. Um, you're not giving me a commission. You're not even going to take me to lunch. I should take you to lunch. But there are no kickbacks. So if you choose to contact Mr. Mr. Harris, that's strictly an individual decision. But that's how Hugh and I got started, my husband and I. You had given a conference about four or five years ago. And my big take-home message was compound interest. I was saying to you, had went around and you asked, what were our goals? And I was saying to you, I want to get all of my children out of college with no student loan debt. And after that, I was going to aggressively pay off the house. And you said, key words, compound interest makes your money grow exponentially. Remember right. that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So, so that's how we got started. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, and sometimes the pearls of wisdom that you get over time, it's all the information people had. So I think, especially in our community, uh, in the African-American community, a lot of the message has always been, hey, pay off your mortgage and, and, you know, get some life insurance and all those things are important. But 
sometimes there's more prudent uses of your assets. And I look at I look at the money that we've accumulated almost like a truck. It's like an asset that you need to strategically deploy for your overall well-being. So if I, if I have a truck and I know that truck can go out and pick up, you know, five uh, piles of dirt and I can take that dirt and sell it and I can I can strategically deploy that truck. Now, if I use my truck to get enough dirt that a wheelbarrow could could use, then I'm not optimally deploying that resource. Right. I could use a wheelbarrow and use the truck for something different. So sometimes people are taking their finite resource, which is their liquid cash, their money, and are doing things like I have a mortgage that's the, the rates three and a half percent. And longer term, I may be able to earn seven, eight, nine percent on that liquid cash. And I'm using that cash to strictly pay the mortgage off and I'm not investing properly. Whereas the, at the end of 10, 20 years, I would have had more money had I invested it at 8% versus paying down a debt at 3.5%. So that's when we had that conversation was really around, okay, well, these are all very valid goals. Of course, you want to retire mortgage-free, but how can we think about that strategically? Perhaps it makes more sense to allow this money to grow for the next 10, 15 years. And if you still want to pay that mortgage off, you can simply write a check and pay that mortgage off directly at that time. And along the way, you're deducting the interest on it. So from a net net, from a tax perspective, the cost of capital, the cost of what it costs you to have that debt outstanding is less than three and a half or whatever the mortgage rate is because you're writing that interest off from a tax perspective. So when you start looking at all the different elements that you're dealing with, you know, debt, your tax bracket, all these different factors, and you're trying to optimize how you're deploying finite resources, that's where that holistic planning comes into play and that's where the compounding um, is important. So I wanna to say to you, when Hugh and I, after this, we went home and we really put those numbers together on a compound interest calculator and I was sold. So we um, asked you to take us on as clients. And the first thing that you did was you looked at where we were. You looked at our fi big financial picture. You set up, we set up goals. We talked about how to implement them. And you looked at our 401ks and you discovered that my husband had an annuity that he had had for more than 15 years that hadn't grown any money. So from that point, it was important for me to learn about what financial planners do and who they are. Now, anybody can be called a financial planner. I can be called a financial planner and I have nowhere near your knowledge base. So I wanna talk about who needs a financial planner, what's the difference between a fiduciary, commission base, as well as um, robo, uh, planners in that con commission base may be biased towards a particular company or a fund and robo advisors is where you implement a lot of data into a computer and out pop an uh, algorithm and that's what you're going by so tell us about financial planning sure i mean it's uh, i think there's recently been a lot more talk around trying to structure the industry a little differently because of what you're saying it's very confusing so there's, there's really no, no legal limitation on who can call themselves a financial advisor, as you said. You have a lot of people out there that are just saying, hey, I'm gonna hang up a sign and say I'm a financial advisor. And they're really a salesperson trying to sell a high commission product. And um, you know, that, that was kind of an old school way to approach finance, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, there'd be the, the insurance guy would come to your house or somebody would come by and say, hey, you know, buy this mutual fund. And that was it, that was, it was a transaction. Um, a, a true financial planner is, is more of a relationship. They're, they're, they need to understand what you're trying to do from a qualitative perspective. And then they need to be able to quantify those qualitative goals and apply a strategy to it. So I am an independent financial advisor. So I operate as a fiduciary. I'm also a certified financial planner where you go through two years of um, school and in the areas of retirement planning, tax planning, insurance planning, this holistic financial planning training, then you pass a 10 hour exam and then you're able to call yourself a certified financial planner or you'll see the CFP. But the reason that's important is because as a CFP, you also hold that fiduciary obligation, which is basically a legal obligation to do what is in the best interest of your client. And you're, you're held to a, a higher standard so you can legally operate as an 
financial advisor, as a financial advisor with a company and not have a fiduciary obligation to the client. That is legal and permitted by law and not everyone ha has that standard. So um, who needs a financial advisor? And you also mentioned the robo advisors. I think um, for someone that's younger and they're, the only thing they really need to do is save and they're just trying to accumulate, I think those robo advisors have a place. Um, they're, they're less expensive than you, than, than you would have to pay with a, a full financial advisor. Um, cause it's not, you know, it's not free to, to get professional services in these areas. So if you're, if you're really just trying to put some money away and you're just getting started, I think those robo advisors could be helpful. Um, you're giving them some information. They're getting you a nice asset allocation based upon that. And then you're trying to accumulate over time. Now, typically a robo advisor, they're going to use index funds. And index funds are basically funds that allow you to track the entire market. There's no real discernible um, strategy as far as which investments are better than other investments. In an index fund, you buy everything. You buy the entire market and you hope that the entire market goes up over time. And, and historically it has, and we would anticipate that it will. So that's not a bad strategy for people that are trying to accumulate assets. As, as you acquire assets, you know, a robo-advisor can't advise you on whether to pay down the mortgage or whether to deploy additional funds to educate your children or how to strategically draw down from a portfolio to mitigate taxes or what happens when you start to file for Social Security. When should you take it? How do you think about the Medicare uh, decisions in conjunction with your tax bracket and Social Security and all these things? In an environment like this, should I use an index fund or should I be a bit more discerning as far as the types of investments that may be more uh, appropriate for the, an environment like this where we're having so much economic turmoil? So as you acquire and accumulate more assets, almost categorically, it would benefit um, you as you accumulate assets to have an actual professional um, in your corner trying to help you through some of that process. So a little bit about that. One, I never thought that I could afford a financial advisor. Um, you know, just like you, I was a farm kid. I ate free and reduced price meals in the cafeteria, murder burgers and suicide fries. <laughs> right. Every day I scurried before class to breakfast and every, every lunch period, I got my fries and my burger and my fish sandwich and that's what I had to eat. So I understand this. I never thought that I could, I could afford a financial advisor. So oftentimes there's a minimum amount to get invested, maybe $100,000. And as a fiduciary, everything costs money. If you go to the grocery store, it costs money. If you go on a vacation, it costs money. And oftentimes, I think the average cost is probably 1%. Am I correct? Yeah, that's, that's pretty standard. 1% per year mm -hmm. of the assets under management. Sure, sure. That, that's, then, that's pretty standard. Then you have those salesmen, those, those, those commission people. And oftentimes, without any degree, they've been in some market doing something and they entice you to a big fancy meal, you know, come to so-and-so steakhouse and I'll feed you. We'll talk wealth management. Or they invite you to a university conference and they try to entice those who are nearing retirement age to bring their money in and to get lumped into some significant time period where they're getting a commission and you're locked in for 10 years and you may potentially not gain very much, much money. Right. Now that, that typically is a mistake. And that, that's where, um, unfortunately, it seems that in the African-American community, um, oftentimes uh, we're preyed upon for those kind of solicitations. So um, it, if someone wants to come and give you financial advice one time, it, imagine your situation in 2002 right? It's different than it is in, in 2020. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Your life is different. So if someone came to you in 2002 and said, Paula, Q, do da -da 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 -da, and buy this, thank you, and they're gone, and they're not following up, you know, what's going on with Lex, and what's going on with this, and what's going on with that, you know, you don't know what's going on with the kids, you don't know, hey, I might have moved, or my job, I'm promoted, or I got laid off, or all these things happen, and the relationship, that's why the relationship is important. So um, I, I saw a, a statistic the other day. 
it said that about 28% of white professionals have a financial advisor and about half as many black professionals have a financial advisor. So yeah, the fee is 1%. Typically, that's a pretty standard fee, mm -hmm. but you're going to pay the money one way or the other mm -hmm. because um, the outcomes, studies have shown the outcomes are, are much improved having a financial advisor. And, and a lot of what I do is it's not that, hey, here's some superstar investment that no one in the world knows about. It really is just kind of going through the process and understanding all the different dynamics and how they, the interplay between those various dynamics and how this decision impacts that decision. And that's really the, the main value add in the overall process. So it's interesting. I read an article and I'll put it at the bottom of the show notes. And it said by mid-century, um, I believe it was 2054, that African-Americans, people of color will lose their accumulated wealth. And you gave a webinar recently, and that's why I love you. You're constantly touching. It's not that one time fits all. Beginning of the year, you call us, we have a set time, we discuss goals for the year. In the middle of the year, you call me, Paula, have you implemented the goals? What are we doing? How are we tracking that? So I think that's very important. And what you did say in terms of numbers, because people like to see numbers, you said on average, middle-class American, African-Americans may retire with $400,000 in retirement, but on the same complimentary average white American with the same income, the same status may um, retire with $1.8 million because it's being managed differently. Is that so? That's right. There's, there's a lot of reasons why. And um, one of the things that's really important as far as just, just messaging is concerned, it's, it's not just about your lifetime, right? Many people, we're in Washington, D.C., metro area. Many people work for the government, and they have very strong pensions, so they're not going to starve in retirement, right? They're going to have several thousand dollars a month coming in, come heck or high water, right? Mm -hmm. But what, what, I, what I've observed, and I, I worked in a high net worth group when I worked at this Fortune 500 company. I was there for 12 years, and I was one of the, um, I, was, I was highly regarded there. And I worked, most of my clients um, weren't African-American. And I had over 350 clients. So I, I've done thousands of client meetings, literally, over an 18-year period. And I've seen the difference. And it's not just the accumulated wealth. So yeah, there's a dis disparity between the wealth accumulation. A lot of that can be explained by inheritance, which makes total sense, right? I've, I've had teachers that weren't necessarily highly compensated with multi-million dollar accounts because they had received a significant inheritance. It was nothing, nothing for one of my clients to come in and say, we need $300,000 because Johnny wants to buy a house here and we're going to put the down payment down. One of my clients gave his son $1 million when he graduated law school just to get started. He wrote him a check for a million dollars. So the, the, the concept of multi-generational wealth and maximizing resources during this time period, even if you don't necessarily need it all to, to be able to do those things. Paul, if, if someone finds out in our community that, that their parents were paying for their college, they look down upon them. Oh, you're just, you're on easy street. Oh, somebody paid for your college. I had to take loans. What's up with you, right? right? Which is ridiculous. People are embarrassed to say that their parents paid for their college. Like there's some kind of a mark against them. That's what, that, that, that's, that's the idea. The like mindset you said, change. You don't want your kids graduating college with the same kind of debt that many people had incurred just to try to get themselves to the middle class. So by the time you pay that off, you're 40. And now, you know, okay. when you retire, you have 400,000 bucks. So there's a lot of reasons why. But there's some things that, that we can do that we have agency over, different ideas that we can implement that can help improve that number by the time you retire and then by the time you transfer. Well, my favorite book says we are to leave an inheritance to our children's children. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I know which one that is. <laughs> on your website, Platinum Bridge Wealth, if you have a, a book there, a free resource, and it says the 15 things that you must do before even thinking about retiring. So let's talk about some retirement. And, you know, I can sit with you all day because you're such a brilliant 
gifted, intelligent person in that you don't talk and not know what you're talking about. You know, you, when you sit under the feet of someone to learn and to grow and to understand, you, I'm there with you. you, you as well as your wife. You guys are such an asset to my family. And I love you, your boys. We love you, too. We love you guys all. Thanks. So let's talk about retirement. Let's talk about 401ks, 403bs, TSPs versus Roth IRAs. Okay. Well, you know, most people, most professionals have access to a company retirement account. And um, that's typically the best place to start um, the investments. Um, people always bring up the Roth account and it's excellent. If you, if you, once you're able to, to fund that, that 401k account, if you can add some money to the Roth account, it's a great thing to do uh, because that money that accumulates in the Roth account, when you pull it out in the future, it comes out tax free. So the money in the 401k accounts, 403bs, every dollar that you have in there, you really only have about 66 cents roughly because everything you pull out, you have to pay taxes on. So you have a million dollars in there. You should probably think you have more like six hundred fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars after you pay the taxes. So when you're calculating how much you need, um, it can it can overinflate your your numbers. The Roth account, you're pulling that money out tax free, and and this is actually pretty significant. When you pass away, you can pass it to your heirs, and they're going to be required to take some money out of it, but they can pull that money out tax free as well. So it's, it's a, a big deal. And the fact that we are already an extreme deficit in this country and with the stimulus programs that we're implementing, I mean, we're already at $21 trillion in debt, right? Before and then we were, this. <laughs> before all this stuff, right. So then now we're adding an extra couple trillion dollars as far as stimulus is concerned. I would posit that over the next decade or so, tax rates are going to go up, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the current tax breaks administered by um, our president are, are set to be rescinded in the year 2025. It's already on the books. So when that happens, you know, we're going to have to pay this stuff back at some point. So the Roth account is, is important. So again, I think it's essential that we invest money. And I talk to a lot of people and that's why I got into this Money Minutes That Matters because this is my this is my passion. And people are not maximizing. So before we move towards today's market, let's talk about some of the maximums you can contribute in terms of age and relations to Roth and a 401k. Some contribution amount. Um, 401k, you're able to contribute 19,500. If you're over, if you're 50 or over, you can do an additional 6,500. Okay. All right, so you can do $26,000 um, for the 401k. For the Roth account, contributing to a Roth account, you can do 6000 If you're 50 or over, you can add an additional 1000 for 7000 But if you make over a certain dollar amount, you're excluded from contributing to a Roth account. So uh, if you're single, you make over $139,000, you're excluded. If you're, if you're uh, married and you file jointly, if it's over 206, you're excluded. So then it becomes, all right, well, how else could I figure out a way to contribute to a Roth account. What you can do is you can simply convert money from an IRA account or an old 401k account. You can convert it over into a Roth IRA account, regardless of how much money you make. So say, for example, you make $300,000 a year. Great. You, you can't contribute to a Roth account, but if you have an IRA account, so you have $100,000 in an IRA account, you can convert all or a portion of that. You're going to pay income taxes. So you, have, you make 300000 You have 100000 in, in an IRA account, and you want to convert 50000 to a Roth. So you make three hundred. You convert fifty. Now you're going to be taxed on three fifty for that year. You're going to pay income taxes on that $50,000 conversion, but you'll never pay taxes again. So, so if you gain you think, a few hundred thousand dollars, that's your money in a Roth account. That's right. So you're, you're 45, you convert, and then that money grows. Say you don't pull the money out till you're 75. It's grown for 30 years. That 50 may be, you know, whatever, 250, 300,000 by that point, you're pulling it out tax-free. So all that growth, you're not taxed on. In any other environment, you're going to pay taxes on. Uh, corona has kicked our nation's economy in the backside. 
our state and local municipalities, our pockets. You have almost 35 million Americans applying for unemployment. Yeah. So where do we go from here? What do you do with your clients? Are you saying just sit there, don't do anything? Are you saying pull your money out and just put it under your mattress? How are you managing the money of your clients in this economic climate? Well, you don't want to pull the money out. This is, this is not the time. I, again, I grew up at the beach. So I tell people, when that storm hits, that's not the time to be outside putting boards up on the windows. You need to have some stuff in place prior to, because we, we never know what's going to happen. There's always some issue du jour, right? Now it's a, a global pandemic that nobody had predicted before it was a, the banks were going under. Then you have the tech bubble. There's always a reason why these markets are going crazy. So in the short term, anything can happen with the stock market. So the first thing I tell any one of my clients, any money that you need for the next seven years should not be exposed to stocks ever. If you need that money within seven years, you should not have stock exposure. Now, the stock piece of the overall portfolio is for money seven plus years down the line. And that allows you to kind of go through these different uh, variations. Now, this is, this is serious, but the most important thing you do is not sell out of this market because, um, and there's a data that I, that I present in my webinars, it's a data piece. If, um, if you miss the top 10 days in the market over a 15 year period, so over 15 years, if you miss 10 of the best days, because you're not in the market, you re reduce your return by half mm. for missing 10 days over a 15 year period. So I have no idea when the markets are going to be up or when they're going to be down from a day-to-day -day basis, it's impossible to predict. I don't know. So my clients are invested. Now what I'm doing strategically is rebalancing the portfolio. So as we do our planning, say we decide a client should have 60% in stock and 40% in safer investments like bonds and cash based upon their personal situation. Well, if it's 60% in stock, if that's the target, well, now it may be 53% in stock because the, the stock portion has, has come down, right? So I'm actively buying back into the market at, at depressed prices. And I don't know when the markets are going to recover, but I know that my clients don't need that stock portion any, and for the next several years, right? Because you should have at least a seven-year horizon. So I'm buying things on sale like you would anywhere else. So that's the first thing. You want to start rebalancing, getting yourself back to your target allocation. The other thing is in, in this environment, this is a unique situation because some sectors are performing much better than other sectors. You have sectors like the tech sector and the healthcare sector, whereas I'm not going to stop using Google because I have to sit at home, right? That's right. So Google is doing, I'm buying stuff on Amazon all the time, right? That's right. Because, right. So there's certain areas, but I'm not driving my car very much. I'm not buying a new car right now, right? I wouldn't even consider going to a dealership, right? I'm not going to the gas station because I'm not driving my car. So in this environment, there are certain sectors that are probably more favorably positioned than other sectors. So while I want 60% in stock for my clients, I've been tweaking some of their sector exposure and buying back into the market at the press prices. We're not selling anything. I'm checking in with my clients to see if there's anything they need immediately so as if I call a client and say, hey, well, you know, I own a business, Antoine, and my, my income now is going to be reduced in half because of this pandemic. So when we did our planning six months ago, I only needed X amount of dollars in cash. Now I need more cash. Okay. Well, from the safe investments, maybe I'm selling some of that, those safe invest, investments preemptively to raise more cash to make sure that I can fund my clients. If my clients are having any kind of... Um, cash flow issue for whatever reason, because they're already retired or their business is slowed down or whatever. I want two years in risk-free investments, cash, CDs. I can fund them for two years. Now, typically, historically, this is, this is a bear market. When you're 20% uh, down from the top, it's considered a bear market. When you drop 20%, that's mm -hmm. a bear market. Mm -hmm. We're in a bear market, clearly. We've had a nice little rebound here but they typically last 17 months on average, regardless of the reason going back through 1926. They typically last 17 months. You're typically down 41% or so during a bear market. So, you know, we, we have some runway ahead. I would anticipate typically as you enter a bear market, you go down, 
you have a nice little rebound like we're seeing, then you go down again. That's typically what you see. It doesn't happen every time, but typically. So I would not be surprised if we pull back again. So yeah, you kind of have to kind of prepare yourself for the storm, but I'm not selling anything, no, unless there, there's cash that's, that's needed and I'm not selling stock in that case. And I'm buying back into the market and, and shifting some of the sector. So what you're saying is there's several different kinds of recoveries. And I talked about this in a segment uh, about a month ago. There's that V recovery where precipitous drop, precipitous uptake. There's that U recovery where precipitous drop, we stay at the bottom, and then we go up on an incline swiftly. And then there's that W I think you just mentioned where there's precipitous drop, we go back on the uptake, but potentially we can go back down again. Is that what you're right. implying? Right, right. And I, I don't have a crystal ball, so I could be totally wrong. I mean, sure. it, it, if, I had a, if I had a crystal ball, then I, wouldn't, I would just trade my own account and know exactly what's going to happen, right? right. So in, in, in an environment like this, what, what we're trying to do is say, okay, if we have contingency plans in place, if this happens, if this is a prolonged situation, if we don't have a vaccine, they're anticipating a vaccine the next 12 to 18 months, who knows, right? We don't know that for a fact. They're anticipating some kind of treatment within the next 12 months. We're not sure. They're trying to bring different states back online. Maybe this is too early. Maybe that we see an uptick again in cases. And you know, as a, as a, as a nurse and professional as well, I mean, who knows? So we need to have contingencies in place. So I want to be able to fund my clients. Um, I want to prepare for the long haul. And I know that I'm buying assets on sale that I have earmarked for at least seven years out. So I don't, I don't really care what happens with that stock piece in the next year or so, but I'm confident that in five years that this would have been a good buying opportunity. I'm confident in that based upon history and all the other calamities that have happened. And there have been very many, and I can show you a chart with the world was going to blow up because of the terrorists and World War II and the oil crisis and stagflation and inflation and all these different things that have happened that have caused these markets to become volatile. Um, every rolling 10-year period since 1926, if you had all your money in stock, every 10-year period since 1926, there's only been three 10-year periods where there's ever been a loss. And if you have 50% in bonds and 50% in stock, half and half, there's never been a loss in a five-year period, right? And if you have all stock, there's never been a loss in a 20-year period. Okay. So that's why the, the time horizon is so important. And you'll hear all these headlines about oh, the market's down today, the market's up today. That's just noise. Uh, the, the idea is that you just have to have that long-term plan mapped out, and we want to be able to optimize things. And another thing I want to say, if, if you're young, you should have your foot on the gas. If you're young, young. I, I'm young and I have three adult children. I'm young. What's young? <laughs> young, I would say it, it depends on your proximity to need in the month. Okay. Right. So, so young, right. So if you're 50, you're going to work to 70. There's a 20 year runway. Your foot should be on the gas. If you have, okay. you should have at least seven years before you need to stop. If you have 15 plus years before you need to stop, that means you should be taking on more risk. In, in our community. And when I say more risk, that means more stock in your portfolio. I don't mean buying the riskiest stock you can find. That means of your allocation, whether it's 60% stock, 40% bonds, if you have 15 plus years, a good chunk of that should be in stock. Way more than 60% should be in stock if you have that kind of runway, right? And in order to stimulate this economy, they've lowered interest rates. So now the 10-year treasury bond, if you buy some bonds, you're getting like 0.7% on a 10-year bond. So you're tying your money up for a decade at 0.7%, <laughs> right. right? So especially in that environment, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, we'll, we'll come out of this at, at some point. Um, I can talk a lot about you know, the vaccines and what's down the pipeline and you know, all, the, all the other challenges around it. it the, obviously, this is a challenging environment, but the market is a forward-looking indicator. So be, be, before things get better, the markets would have fully recovered. And that, that's important. If you're, waiting, if you're waiting to feel normal again before you start to invest, you will have waited too long. Mm. The mm. markets are, is a forward-looking indicator, at least six months into the future. Okay. So that, that's important. 
So it's interesting. I don't tell my clients or people who call me, I don't say to them, buy individual stocks. I move away from it in that, again, today is doing well, it's zooming and all of a sudden you made a massive downturn. So I did text you a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, Antoine, I said, look at Amazon. Amazon's moving. I said, look at Netflix. We're all home. And then I said, look at Zoom. Here, we're on Zoom now. I said, look at Zoom. And the first thing you said to me, you said two things to me. One, Paula, you only spend the money that will not be needed for essentials. Secondly, you said you don't buy individual stocks for your clients. I do not. Okay. So what you're saying to me, or if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying everything is on sale. So if I have $500 to, let's say, to purchase Zoom, and let's say if Zoom was $150 a stock. So if I have $500 prior to COVID, then I can buy 3.3 stocks of Zoom, right? But now, if all things being equal, Zoom may be down to $100. So now my $500 that I'm putting in my 401k every pay period, now I'm buying five shares of Zoom. Is that what I'm hearing correctly? That's right. That's right. But um, Paula, most people should not buy individual stocks because all the things that people are afraid of in the stock market, that's where it manifests when you buy an individual stock because you, you, that stock can go to zero, literally, <laughs> and, and it can for many different reasons. And <laughs> about three years ago, everything was marijuana. Now I don't smoke right, marijuana. Right, right. I'm not a proponent of it. I'm a healthcare professional. Mm -mm. But, and I don't think, oh, it's a safe drug. I think it's a gateway drug, but that's a different segment, right? So everything was marijuana. I bought marijuana, everything. I just dumped money into the market. And again, I never um, invested money and I still don't invest money in anything I can't afford to lose. That's always been our philosophy. So I dumped all this money in, in, in uh, marijuana. I made no money. I lost more than probably about 75% of all that I invested in that. So I agree with you. That, and that, that's what's, that's what's it's frustrating sometimes. People, you know, they hadn't really invested before. And instead of just getting the plan together and getting a systematic process in place, they asked me, what stock should I buy? I'm like, you know, I, I personally own maybe 10, 12 stocks. And I mean, the, the amount of research and the amount of time that's involved with, with tracking the individual stocks is, is a lot. And, and most people don't have the expertise, they don't have the time. And I, I learned through a process of several years how to purchase stocks. And sometimes you, you're wrong, you need to figure out how to get out of stocks the right way. Um, so for the average person, 95% of the people, they should own ETFs, which are exchange traded funds, which are very broad and very diversified. They own hundreds of different stocks in one investment or mutual funds. And that's what I do for my clients because my clients can't afford to lose the money. And then I tell them separately, if you have some extra cash, once you've funded your retirement accounts and you've done all, the other, all these other things, now you still want to invest some money, then hey, Stocks are fine if you're doing the research and you're going to track them, but people buy them and let them sit there. And then they look up and it's like, oh, well, I lost half of my money. People were calling me three years ago about Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> you buy Bitcoin. By the time, by the time it gets on the average person's radar screen to buy something, if, if, if you're not an investor and you just happen to hear about something, I would almost 100% guarantee it's too late to buy. <laughs> people had never heard of Bitcoin, then it became popular. And they, oh, should I buy it? Okay, so two more questions, Antoine. So if I chose to use you as a financial advisor, is my money going to the bank of Antoine? Who's managing my funds? How do no. I get to see my numbers? Right, no, I, I manage the assets, but your assets are held separately, separately from me. It's held, um, I hold, I hold my, my client's assets at TD Ameritrade. TD Ameritrade. And those accounts are fully insured through Lloyds of London. Um, they have full access to their accounts. I don't have access to any withdrawals from their accounts. I can simply make changes. So, hey, if I need to make an investment, I do that. If I need to sell an investment and switch it out, it's called a limited power of attorney to make those changes uh, as needed, but I have no withdrawal capabilities. Uh, those accounts are all protected. Um, I have insurance personally against for my business and against any errors or omissions. So say, for example, plus say Paula, 
I promised I'm going to buy this fund for you tomorrow. Then my kids run in here and I forget and the fund doubles and I forgot to buy it. Well, we have a contract that I said I was going to do something and you were expecting me to do it and I forgot. Well, that's an error or omission. So you have errors and omissions insurance. Um, and then the accounts are protected and they're separate from the advisor. And that's not just me. That's any independent advisor. That's just, sure. that's by law. Sure. Yeah. Now, this is more of a debt management question. And this is my last question for you. And I get, I get so many questions. And 50, if you listen to my show, almost 50% of the people who call in have student loan debt. Now, I've talked to people and I've listened to people and I'm, a, I'm, I'm learning to listen more. That's my 2020 thing. I'm going to learn to sit and be still. But I've heard parents say, I'll just take out a HELOC to pay for my child's tuition. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, I won't fund my retirement. I'm 50 years old. I won't fund my retirement, but I'll fund my child's education. Or when my child finishes college, they'll take care of me. How do we manage some of those money um, stories? Wow, that, that's a deep question, especially in, in the, the professional black community, because, um, you know, most people of a certain age, they've been taught the key to changing your life and, and having things go better for you is education. And we really value that. We should. We value that for our kids. And, you know, many of us had student loan debt. I mean, I was fortunate. I, my debt was incurred for graduate school. Um, you know, my mom helped out as much as she could. So when I graduated undergrad, I didn't have any student loan debt. It's very little. Yeah. And uh, you know, when I went to grad school, I got some more debt. Right. But um, I know that we, we don't want that for our kids. And I've seen people make those sacrifices, but there are other options for your kids. So your kids may not be, if, if you can't afford it, they may not be able to go across the country and go to Stanford. Uh, maybe you can't afford it. There are other options for the kids. I know it looks great to have the bumper sticker and everything. You want to be able to say, my kid is going such and such a place. But, you know, realistically, there's no scholarships for retirement. Mm. So there, there are other things that you could do to make sure your kids are properly educated mm. um, and not compromise your retirement. And the, the whole concept that your kids are a retirement plan for someone. I mean, I, I mean, me personally, my own personal value system, I don't subscribe to that because there's a lot of people in our age range as well that are needing to take care of their own parents and their kids are still trying to find their way. So their kids are home, they're paying their own bills and doing their own saving and they're still trying to help their parents. And it's a, it's a, a really very strenuous burden to put on uh, someone. So no, I don't, I don't expect, I wouldn't want to do that to my kids. So no, um, I, I think I'm doing my kids a favor of making sure that I'm financially independent Yes. And I, I would encourage them to do the same thing. So, um, yeah. And so I, I think education is important. I value that tremendously. My kids are hopefully going to be well-educated. They decided to go to school. The money will be there. But um, I'm not going to compromise my retirement savings. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage my clients to do the same thing. Well, Antoine, I got to tell you, I love you and I appreciate you. You, you. I, I couldn't wait to get you on this show. I talked to you probably towards the end of last year. And I've been bringing up my thought process and trying to put things on paper because we could talk forever. <laughs> That's right. I can make three segments out of this. We could talk about what do, what do you do at 30? What do you do at 40? What do you do at 60? Um, but you're right. We have to start preparing for our retirement day one because there are no scholarships. Whether you're right. saving 200 a month or 500 a month or 1,000 a month, the time to retire is the day you start working. But I'm gonna let you go because I know this is prime time of your day. Please tell my sister Adele that I love her. Jakey, Mason, give them a hug for me. I know your daughter's in Atlanta, but thank you for giving me your time. Oh, Paula, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. You as well. I'll see you when all this is over. Good, God bless you, be safe. Okay. God bless you as well. It's not about today. It's not about looking good on the outside because I looked good on the outside. No one ever knew that behind my four walls, we were broke. We had two kids in college. I had two kids in elementary school. We had just bought the new house. We were driving the cars. I looked fantastic on the outside, but I had $240,000 of debt. I couldn't breathe. There was a vice grip around my neck. 
and I didn't know what to do. So it took me three years and we sacrificed everything. Allowance, eating out, vacations, we took it all off the table. And my husband and I worked hard to get out of debt. And this is why this is my passion. I want to give you what I know so that it'll benefit you. So Mr. Antoine Harris, I greatly appreciate you. This show was primarily sponsored by EAJ1023radio.com. Continue to follow. I love you and have an amazing day and stay safe. Roberts Targets Financial is not a certified professional service of finances, brokers, accountants, taxes, insurance, or legal. We research the advice that is given to provide the most accurate, up-to-date information. This information is designed to work in conjunction with your information. All information is suggestions. We recommend that you consult with a trusted, licensed professional for your specific decisions. All information is for general purposes. We are not liable for any losses or gains. We accept no responsibility for any decisions made after participating on or from listening to the show or from Robert's Targets Financial. If you like this episode, hit the subscribe button.